Hey everybody, welcome back to the High Performance Zone. Today I have Dr. Mark M and M Mitchell. Uh, he's an expert in kinesiology, so basically motion, right? And in fact, uh, the title of now is not the time to be still. You're going to really like this podcast because it's very simple, and that is we need to get out and walk. Okay, walking is the superhero of exercise. So a lot of the times, you know, we're going to these high performance elite athletes. What this is about is everyday person. How can you connect the motion of exercise with not only high performance, but the mind body connection. So we dive into uh, a lot of things here. Most of all, though, this is going to help each and every one of us. Uh, he also talks about motion is the lotion for the, the lotion for the joints. Um, I love uh, that he was an ex football player, but now this is about his mom getting his mom out to walk once a day. The, the benefits of, of walking are unbelievable. And then if you could do it outside, there is definitely science behind how this will help mental health too, depression, emotions. So this is really about you. This is about a better health for you. And it's simple. We just need to get, get going. And uh, right after this uh, podcast, I'm going for a walk. So Eminem and Gucci. Ready? Hit it. Hey, Mark, Gucci here. Welcome to the High Performance Zone. I got to tell you, I've been really excited about having you on my podcast because of your background, uh, what you know about kinesiology and high performance and people and really the mind-body connection. So first off, uh, welcome. I think you're coming from Canada. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm a couple hours outside of Toronto. Moved here about five years ago in London, Ontario. Awesome. Uh, you know, we were just got off with sugar. We got to get you a call sign. Uh, we'll see what happens in the podcast because on call signs, you don't get to pick them, right? It, it's something that has to, uh, uh, has to naturally happen. But we may have an M&M coming out here. Mark Mitchell, M&M. We'll see. Sounds good. All right. Hey, just so um, everybody knows, you, you dive deeply as a professor into the, the, the physical side of high performance. And one thing that, that I'm always working on, and I know our audiences too, is this connection between the mind and body, right? So the physical aspect, but the mental aspect of, of high performance, you know, where do you like to start with that? Um, you know, I mean, in, in, in my personal life, I always, I always sacrifice work time um, to be active. In fact, like, you know, just half an hour ago, I made sure... Um, I got a workout in a walk and lifted a couple of weights for the first time in a couple of years because of the pandemic. Um, because, no kidding. Wait a minute. The first time you lifted in two years? Well, I was like second or third time I've lifted in, in about two years. Yeah. And I used to do it a lot playing, playing football back in the day. Yeah. I mean, you still got the traps. I can tell you've got, you know, physical oh, strength on uh, it. It's just the t-shirt. It's the t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Um, you played football for Calgary, right? The Stampede? Yeah, Calgary St. Peters. Um, yeah, the most famous player to come out of Calgary is probably Doug Flutie, yeah. uh, who played for the Bills for a few years, I think. Um, but yeah. that was before my time. And I, I was not a star player, but I was there for a couple of years and have a couple of herniated discs to, to show for it. And a <laughs> <couple of> concussions. <laughs> now, you were a linebacker, correct? Yeah. Yeah. All right. What'd you play at? What was your playing weight? I was like 220, 225. Okay. And what'd you run the 40 in? Uh, hand time was 4-4. We had a 4-4. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah, That's great. That's 220 pounds, 4-4. No wonder you played in the pros. Yeah, I actually played against Doug Flutie when he was at Boston College. Uh, I played oh, no way. Navy. Yeah, and I was a defensive back, you know, and uh, it, it, it was fun. So I'm glad that you got a chance to play pro ball, though. Where did you play your undergrad ball? I played at Queens University, um, which is a, you know, Canadian college. Um, you know, some people call it the Harvard of the North, mm. um, okay. you know, but my, my coaches there thought I was not the, the sharpest tool in the shed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you proved them wrong. You got, funny. you got a PhD. I mean, uh, uh, how did I, made, I made mistakes, you know, on the field. I shouldn't have made. Well, you know, hey, we're all about debrief here. And that is, what do you learn from your mistake, right? It's not that you made it. It's what you learn. In fact, you know, with football and uh, also, you know, as a professor, how do you, what's your learning loop? What have you found 
works really well. I would call it a, a brief execute debrief kind of methodology, this cadence yeah. of execution, you know, get prepared uh, before an event. We do it in football. We do it in life, do it in Blue Angels, uh, execute on it as best you can. But the real, I think, key is, you know, having some sort of learning loop feedback. Uh, what if, what is your studies? I know, well, let's do it two ways. A, you played football, so you know very well about the filming and skills and all that. But what have you learned since then about this learning loop uh, concept? You know, just, you know, like I've, I've never met anybody interesting who didn't have a bunch of different failures, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and learn from those failures and, and come back stronger, working harder, wanting it more, you know. So there's a lot of that, I think. Um, but in, in my in my teaching, for example, which is about half of my job, we get some pretty um, pretty what's the word uh, like honest feedback from the students because it's it's all anonymous and and sometimes it's 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 bad you know feedback and, and constructive you mm -hmm. know so so every year I try to when I'm when I'm about to relaunch a set of new courses I'll go back to those five or six pages of, of written notes and try to pick out one or two things that I can actually apply to the design of this new set of courses and and the other the other half of the job would be the research part and and it's, it's pretty cutthroat too. So I don't know how much you know about the academic publishing world, but when you send like a, a scientific study off to be reviewed and published, they're not coming back with like yeah. rain, rainbows and lollipops, right? They're looking for like every little possible mistake. So I guess you learn to grow a thick skin in football and in academia, but I'm, I'm assuming pretty much everywhere else in the working world too, you know? What are some of the, I'm glad we, let's dive into some of your studies. Uh, what are you focused on right now? Or what are some of the studies that you think would are, are most meaningful to people? Uh, well, we're, what I'm trying to do with, with my, my, my team, I guess, is trying to figure out how we can uh, encourage as many people as possible to be physically active. Okay. Um, not train for triathlons, but move a little bit more. Um, and so we're using rewards to do that. And that's just one behavior change technique. So like monetary rewards um, that, that we've really been focusing on. But really, I like to think about um, like the behavior change interventions that we put together is like a, like a Sunday, you know? So you got the cherry on top, which is the reward that people get excited about. It's the reason why they download our apps or whatever. Um, but there are other behavior change techniques at play. So we're, we're setting realistic personalized goals for people. We're providing biofeedback we're linking them with similar others, you know, friends, family, colleagues, whatever. Um, and we think we're, and I, I guess our, our raison d'etre is to try to create the best behavior change Sunday we can um, so that we can activate the most people we can because the benefits of physical activity are unmatched, you know? No, not that eating healthy and not drinking alcohol, not smoking aren't important, but physical activity, I mean, the, the breadth of, of benefits and the magnitude of the benefits it's it's really hard to match so man let's dive into that more first off uh you mentioned your app i want to make sure people right away realize you've launched a, what's called caterpillar correct tell me a little bit about what that is yeah so caterpillar is actually like version 2.0 of a really successful app that we launched in canada called carrot which is carrot rewards which is no longer uh around but essentially we rewarded um over a million canadians with loyalty points so like points you can redeem at you know grocery stores or gas stations or movies or whatever um and to engage in healthy behaviors primarily hit individualized daily step counts as measured by a smartphone which pretty much everybody has okay. um and uh and we've got eight or nine academic publications that show that you know it worked as cost effective and it worked better in certain situations and with certain subgroups um, so that was sort of the launching pad for Caterpillar, which we've been working on for about a year and just launched in the United Kingdom last week. Uh, and we're hoping to expand to the entire United Kingdom and then other, um, you know, Western democracies sooner than later. Actually, I'll just mention this, you know, Boris Johnson, UK Prime Minister, he got COVID about, let's call it a year ago. And he was- yeah, I love your about, say that again, about? About, yeah. yeah that was awesome. You Canadians, I, I love it. <laughs> Yeah, keep yeah. going so yeah you got COVID. um boy so boris johnson yeah he got COVID, and i i guess he was hospitalized right he had like, a severe 
symptoms in part potentially and i guess i guess i'm just speculating because he he might be carrying on carrying a little bit too much weight you know overweight or obese or whatever so he decided um you know this is a big problem so i want to start paying people um to lose weight and so they just launched a pilot or just about to launch a pilot program the department of health and social care in, in the united kingdom like five million pounds to to get britons to lose weight so they more of them don't end up in hospital or wards with serious COVID symptoms. So Caterpillar, we're trying to sort of take advantage of that momentum in the UK right now. Nice. Um, so anyway, all that Caterpillar, yeah, we're excited about it and uh, are going to be studying it and improving it over the next few months. Awesome. I, I want to make sure people know how to get the app. So just go to the app store and download on Caterpillar or what? It's actually only in, only available in Leeds for, for these next 12 weeks, Leeds United Kingdom. Okay. And then, and then after that, it'll only be available in the UK because what makes it a little bit different is that instead of paying people like a dollar a day, you know, which is what a lot of, a lot of studies and companies do uh, in the States is we're using loyalty points that people overvalue. So we're driving the cost of the rewards way down. So we're at like two or three pennies a day to drive healthy behaviors for over a year or two, Wow, which is like 50 times smaller than most you know, corporate wellness programs will offer yeah. or most like randomized control trials will will study like in a scientific context. So awesome. That's I'm so glad you're able to impact that many people. It's cool to get behind the scenes uh, of uh, something that's this going to change the world, I think. Let's get back into what you mentioned the benefits, the number one benefits of activity, right? And sounds like, you know, you're on a spectrum. Um, the average person, you know, so what is it that, what are the benefits? Uh, and I'm, I know we're not talking just elite athletes here, right? We're talking about every single person, right? So uh, let's dive into that. Why is activity so important? And does it matter what activities you do? Yeah. Yeah. So I sort of, even though I sort of, I trained as an elite athlete and played my, my work interests now are really in trying to activate the general population. Yeah. Um, you know, prevent and better manage chronic conditions that are crippling our healthcare system, at least. I don't know about uh, yours. Um, oh, I think it is. It, it's amazing the, the spend on chronic, you know, people who are right overweight, you know, the yeah. obesity is crazy. Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah. And I mean, then I guess the, the big, I mean, it used to be, you know, be active. So you look good in a bikini or bathing suit or whatever, but more and more as you, I, I, you've kind of alluded to is the mental health benefits of a little mm -hmm. bit of movement, you know, and not only uh, from like a primary prevention perspective, like before the onset of, you know, an anxiety disorder or depression, for example, but as actual treatment, you know, so instead of taking a pill, uh, take it take an exercise or take a walk and we're going to see clinically meaningful uh, reductions in your depressive symptoms for example um, you know or obviously we're going to better manage your blood glucose if you're a type 2 diabetic okay. you know or we're going to help with your pain if you're sitting at the desk all day and you're not moving around enough now have you heard the the phrase lotion uh, motion is lotion for the joints no but i like it no. motion is yeah. lotion all right. yeah so so i don't know what the stats is like maybe 40 or 50 percent um, of American and Canadian adults will, will report, you know, low back pain at some point in their life or mm -hmm. some sort of arthritis at some point in your life. And we're, we're seeing like 10, 15, 20% reduction in, in pain symptoms with walking, you know, again, like, no, we're not talk exercise. It's not like Iron Man, right? right. right. It's walk, walking. And that, that's my preference. I think it's the superhero of exercise because walking. most people can do it because, you know, it can be done outside and the benefits are, you know, immeasurable, you know, so we got diabetes, we got depression, we got pain, we got a good jillion other things. So, and how much, and I love you talked about being outside because I actually live here in Sun Valley, Idaho. I'm looking out my window and I can just walk for, uh, actually we have 300,000 acres. Now I only own one of them, right? It's, it's the natural parks, right? But being outside really affects me in a positive way, right? I mean, like I'm, I'm in a stand-up desk. It looks like you are too. Are you standing up? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that motion is lotion, right? I mean, just a little movement. We're going back and forth. I just took a Thai, a Qigong class this morning just to get movement, right? But let's talk about outside. So why walking outside is so important? Yeah, like I, I don't really know the research. Um, some some of my colleagues have, have studied it and they call it green exercise. 
Um, and I you also call it what brain brain like green green oh green oh I like it. okay green got it yeah so green so green exercise is green exercise better than let's say walking on a on a treadmill staring at a cement wall at your at your local gym you know and I'm just remembering one study found like the two groups of people um, both exercise you know same volume every week same intensity all that stuff one group exercised outside or while looking at 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 pictures or videos of of, of um, you know the outdoors and they saw greater blood pressure reductions um, than the other than the other group so everything the same hmm. except you know look we'll just call it looking at trees led to lower blood pressure reductions which is the number one risk factor for cardiovascular disease right heart attack hmm. stroke so so that's just one, but I mean, the mood, the mood impact, I think is another one. And I don't know any statistics around that, but just being amongst the trees, I think um, the research would show makes you happier, you know, and that's the quality of life index that really is the most important one, right? Like who gives a hoot about you know, blood pressure or blood sugar, you know, numbers that you, you maybe your doctor mentions to you every three months or four months or whatever, uh, but you want to feel better like today. Right? You want to sleep better. You want to be a better husband, better dad. You know, so anyway. Well, and also, isn't there the idea of sunlight too? So being outside, the green and all, but um, you know, I, I've heard a lot of studies about getting that light, uh, not just vitamin D, you know, um, but uh, and and isn't it like that's why some uh, locations that are really foggy and overcast the whole time they see a higher rate of depression all right but tell me about any of that have you you know what's the idea of not only outside and movement but sunlight does that affect yeah. you at all honestly don't know anything about it <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's good. but it makes but but it makes sense and it's it's you know definitely part of the story but what i do know a little bit more about is uh you know i teach a lot about exercise prescription so like if, if you went to your doctor you know um, maybe you've got mild depression, they're going to, they're not going to prescribe you medicine, right? They're going to prescribe you a very specific medicine at a certain dose that you're going to take a certain number of days. It might titrate up and down, right? It's very specific, okay. maybe even down to the brand, you know, and, and exercise is the same way. So, so what are your goals? You know, do, do you want to feel better? Okay. So instead of maybe lifting weights, which you've never done before in your life, um, if you've got a walking trail near you, we're going to prescribe, you know, a certain number of minutes of walking at a cer certain intensity. If you're able to do it outside preferred, you'll get more of a benefit. And so there's all these different sort of parameters nice. that fiddle with when you're encouraging people to be active so they can get the most bang for the buck. So give, give me an example, because I, I really like how you just talked about it's prescriptive, right, to each individual. Um, give me an example. How would a prescription vary? Um, all right, let's talk about, um, let's talk about my sister and my brother-in-law. So my, my sister's got really bad back pain. She has for a while, but not so much lately because she discovered that a 30 or 40 minute walk every day keeps the back pain away. Wow. Um, on the other hand, my brother-in-law, uh, was a great junior hockey player, you know? And so so he wants to play he wants to continue to play hockey because that's part of who he is so i'm not going to go ahead as an exercise professional prescribe walking for my brother-in-law corby right that makes that makes no sense he wants to go top shelf score three goals right so how can we so he's gonna we were we want him to play hockey but maybe we're going to incorporate a little bit of interval training maybe we'll do some resistance training some flexibility so he doesn't hurt himself all that stuff oh nice so, and then when it comes to clinical populations, I mean, it, it can vary widely. You know, I've got somebody with heart failure, somebody with like, you know, early, um, early onset sort of type two diabetes, you know, so these sort of parameters can, you can fiddle with. If you go too intense, you can kill somebody, mm -hmm. right? If, if it's not intense enough, you won't get the therapeutic benefit. You'll be wasting everybody's time. So there's a bunch of things you can fiddle with. How about BFR? Have you studied blood flow restriction? The reason I bring that up is I'm using it right now. And uh, 
Uh, I actually like it. I'm not sure that there's any real study about it, but over, over to you. Uh, first off, everybody knows BFR, blood flow restriction. I, I went to some physical therapy, working on my knee, some arthritis, and uh, we tried this, right? Which is you have a band for everybody's sakes. I know you know what it is, but there's a band that goes around your leg. They uh, pump up the pressure to a certain, I think, 80%. So it restricts 80% of the return flow back to your heart, right? And you only can, you can leave it on for a maximum of eight minutes, minimum of five. And then you're doing a set of 30, uh, let's say squats. And then you got a, a 20 second rest and then 15, 20 second rest, 15, 20 second rest, 15. And let me tell you, they hurt. I mean, I'm, this is not for your average person, right? But um, uh, maybe it is, I don't know. But, and then when, and then you release the pressure and supposedly the, um, the blood, that, that kind of hit uh, really uh, helps grow muscle mass. That's one of the things. So I just said, uh, that's a non-clinical description of what I'm trying right now. Have you ever heard of it? And no. am I crazy? No, I haven't, but it's kind of interesting. So you're starving the working muscle? Yes, but just temporarily. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I guess, I guess it learns to, tr it learns to uh, do the work in sort of a that starved environment and therefore comes back with even greater adaptations makes sense yeah i think actually i think the main reason is when you restrict the blood coming back to the heart and it you starts to hurt right because you can feel it right um but then when you release it the heart act or the brain this is where i don't know right um releases more growth hormones because you've starved it and the body's saying whoa i need X, Y, Z, and, um, and it's released. Now you have to uh, follow that with, you know, obviously a, a good food intake, good protein yeah. or something like that to, so that it can actually build the muscle. So I think the reason that, that I even used it was it actually also puts less strain on the joint. So what you can do is instead of having to use heavy weights, let's say, if you want, um, you can, uh, it's all mostly body weight stuff. Uh, you can release the, uh, the pressure on the joint and get the same benefit that you would need with heavier weights, supposedly. Now, you know, anyone who's listening to this, you know, I'm not a doctor. Uh, we're not saying this works or doesn't work. It's just something I'm trying right now. And I know you definitely want to have be supervised because it's, you don't just wing it, but anyhow, BFR. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It's, you know, it's, I think it just drives the point home that there's a bunch of little things that you can do to try to optimize training benefits, you, you know, training loosely defined, um, you know, just for your regular person who, who isn't necessarily trying to get big or, or do really well in a race or something like that but there are a bunch of things but to me um and i used to work in cardiac rehab we had this exercise prescription triangle that we would also always show our patients tell me on that the bottom, on the bottom of the triangle it's established routine okay right like who cares about what you know jennifer lopez is doing or who cares about you know all this other stuff let's get you doing potentially what you've done before definitely something that you enjoy and do that on a regular basis. Nice. You no. Know? And then the next, the next level in the triangle is increased volume, right? So really, if we're talking about aerobic stuff, it's you know minutes a week kind of thing. So we'll start at you know whatever five or ten minutes a day, three days a week, you know, and kind of grow from there. Sure. Try eventually try to get to the guideline level, but not necessarily because it can be unrealistic for a lot of people. What's and the guideline level that's out there? 150 minutes a week. Okay. And at uh, what, at what kind of heart rate? Yeah. Yeah. So moderate vigorous intensity. So um, it's kind of like, it, it's a brisk walk kind of a pace. Yeah. Right? So, okay. so it's kind of like if you're walking late to, to a bus stop or late to a meeting, like that kind of pace Okay. Um, for 150 minutes. But when I, with the patients that I work with and the students that I'm teaching now who are working with patients, I tell them not even to mention it because the average American, the average Canadian is doing less than half that. Really? So what the hell's the point in saying, you know, like somebody like my mom, you know, she doesn't exercise at all. Like you got to start going five days a week, 30 minutes a day or you're toast, right? That makes no <laughs> sense, right. <laughs> right? Do it once a week. You know, she just started Aquafit again. And she asked me, you know, how many times a week should I do it? And I, and I told her, well, how many times a week are you doing it now? She said zero. So we'll do once a week. Nice. Right? You'll get so much benefit. 
you know that 150 number i always say like you get the most benefit the curve is the sharpest in terms of like health benefit when you go from zero to 60 mm. you know so you got or zero to 30 right the right. most benefit you get from an active lifestyle is when you get go from doing very little to a little bit more as opposed to like going all the way to whatever training for triathlon or 100 oh, that's brilliant right? That's brilliant because, I mean, you are trying to impact a lot of people, right? This isn't the BFR kind of crap I just talked about. This is getting everybody to um, just increase their general health, right? Yeah. yeah. What was the third part of that triangle? We only covered two. Oh, um, optimize intensity. And what do you mean by that? Um, so like heart rate would be one way of measuring um, aerobic exercise intensity. So let's say you're exercising at, 120 130 beats per minute right and that's maybe like you know 50 percent of your heart rate max or your heart rate reserve we call it um then can we get that up a little bit higher because those higher intensities are going to drive aerobic fitness up cardiorespiratory fitness you know like when when you see people you might have seen people like running on the treadmill with like the gas mask on oh yeah trying to figure out how much oxygen you've probably done it trying to figure out how much oxygen you can consume yeah. um that is the number one predictor uh, of health and wellness more what, than the weight. percent of oxygen that your body actually can take in is that what yeah, it is? the amount the amount of oxygen you are able to consume um you know so that's like aerobic fitness or cardiorespiratory fitness more than smoking more than body mass more than all the cholesterol more than all these other things it's an amazing summary variable and it predicts you know uh morbidity and mortality like health and wellness and and early death more than any other variable. A famous researcher called Stephen Blair did a bunch of this cool research um, uh, at, where was he? Where is he? Uh, oh, shoot. I'm drawing a blank. But anyway, his name is Stephen Blair. He's, he's a great researcher. And the name of the study was like longitudinal aerobic study, something like that. Oh. Anyway, he was the first to really drive that point home. And I, and I continue to do it. But that's the top of the triangle. Right. A right. lot of people will, might not get there because it's so hard to establish a routine, you know? Right. I used to work in cardiac rehab. People would come in like literally having died on the table, right? Yeah. Yeah. Brought back to life and still had trouble um, adopting a walking routine or, or a healthy routine. You know, it's very difficult. So. And why is that? What's the mental, what's happening where someone knows it's good for them and still doesn't do it? What do you think? You know, yeah, it's a good point. Um, I think we get complacent in life. We take for granted um, too many things. And one of them is our health and our basic uh, health. So I guess it goes to belief levels. Now I think about it. They, if they truly believed, I would think they would do it. I don't know. What do you think? I think that's part of it. Like people don't necessarily realize how, how good it can be for you yeah. to do, you know, eat, you know, a green vegetable every day or walk a little bit every day. Um, I think if I had to pick one reason, I would say we sort of, we've engineered activity out of our lives. Mm. Right. So it's, you, you really have to be purposeful about it. Mm -hmm. And I do, a, I do a lot of the stuff that I do, uh, is grounded in, in a theory called behavioral economics or nudge theory. Have you heard of that? No, go for um, it. I won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. Um, and it's really the, the reason why we started Care Rewards and continue to work on it with this sort of thing with Caterpillar. Uh, and it, it talks of the theory talks about like choice architecture, right? Like how can we design choice environments to make the healthy choice the easier choice? Um, you know, so, and there's this thing called, there's a human decision bias called present bias, where the, the people, um, the things that people experience in the present are given like a ton of weight and importance, right? So time in the present, uncomfortable feelings in the, in the present, whereas benefits or costs in the future are seriously discounted. Like we care less about those things. We care less about our future selves, more about our present selves. So, you know, for a bunch of years, physical activity promotion people, they've talked about, you know, cut your risk of heart disease, um, you know, limit cancer, you know, that sort of thing. But what people really care about, what they really value is what I said a few, few minutes ago. It's like, I want to sleep better today. I want to be nicer to my wife and my kids. I want to be, do better at work, right? I want to perform better, mm -hmm. right? So those, those immediate benefits, I think, 
we could probably do a, a better job of, of highlighting immediate benefits of, of leading a little bit more of an active lifestyle. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad we, we went on this path because uh, the idea of present moment versus past or future, right? The idea of meditation, even, you know, we could talk about why is the idea of meditation helpful was to stay in that present moment, right? To be aware of that. Um, what's going through my mind then is since there's a bias and it, it makes sense, right? Because I know if I want to work out, uh, you can give me all the stats you want. You can tell me all why it's important. But if I don't feel better, if, it, if, it's, if I'm doing it and, it and it doesn't, it's not fun or exciting or makes me feel better, I'm going to quit, right? And that's why I like what you said about your mom, you know, hey, start once, right? But okay. um, tell me about that, the, the idea of why is the present bias so important to change behavior? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons why we got into the rewards. Mm -hmm. um, so if we, we thought, you know, in learning about nudge theory and stuff, if we can give people a, a small but immediate reward, we might be able to encourage some, not everybody, obviously, um, to choose to, to go to the gym today or go for a walk today, as opposed to that notorious resolution to do better tomorrow. You know, and if we can get people into that routine, you know, six months is sort of that theoretical threshold for maintenance. If we can get people to that like six month mark, you know, with this artificial sort of immediate reward, they might start to experience these natural reinforcers like improved mood, you know, and then start to want to want to do it right. Enjoy doing it and, and feel confident doing it. So. I never heard this six month thing before. So tell me more about that. I know it, it's always hard. Everyone wants to know how long does it take to form a habit? All these kinds of crazy yeah. questions, right? Where does the six months come in? Well, you know, it's probably wrong. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, no, I agree. <laughs> right. It, it depends on the person, depends on where you right. live, depends on, you know, but there's a, a theory called uh, the trans theoretical model or stage of change theory. You've heard of the stages of change. I've heard of it, yeah. but I'm not. Uh, an academic like, go for it go, okay so there's like there's a bunch of stages of change that you go through i think this started in the smoking literature pre-contemplative so like i i'm not i don't want to exercise right or i don't want to quit quit smoking contemplative is like oh i heard john's podcast and they mentioned that this could be good for you like maybe you know sometime i'll do it um and then there's a bunch of different phases initiation so you've just started like in the last three months Anyway, the last one or the second to the last one is maintenance. So according to this theory, getting to six months, you've entered into a maintenance phase. But like in a country like Canada, if you haven't exercised through all four seasons, yeah, you know what I mean, like if you've only exercised in the spring and summer, you can't really expect yourself to be able to battle through those winter um, barriers, right? So well, that's, that's when, you know, us snow sports. I mean, you know, I'm in, I'm in Sun Valley where it's 6,000 feet. So my winter is Alpine skiing, but I find the Nordic skiing way better for me because it kicks my butt, right? A aerobically skate skiing, whatever. Um, and then in the summer, I got to find a new way to get aerobics. So for me, it's, it's mountain biking, right? Or, or hiking. I, I really starting to like to do a lot more hiking. So I'm with you on, uh, I, I guess, you know, tell me more about how do people maintain through seasons? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess the first thing is just just set realistic goals for yourselves, you know, so okay. I'll talk about physical activity just because that's where my heart lies. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think one of the best ways for somebody who hasn't been active in a long time is to use their phone um, that they probably already have. It's like 85% of Americans, maybe 90% of Americans now will have a smartphone that has a built-in motion sensor and track the number of steps that they do for a week. Okay. Um, and once they do, once they know what their like average is, um, add 500 steps and then that becomes your magic number. Oh, that's nice. And, and 500 steps is equivalent to about five minutes of that fast walk that we talked about before. Right. Um, so, and if you do that, let's say if you do it every day, that's 35 minutes, that's a ton of minutes. Right. Or if you do it three days a week, you know, that's 15 minutes. That's not insignificant. Um, so that's probably, you know, one, one good way is like, yes. So your question was, how do you get people to that maintenance phase is set realistic goals and then, and then build on those. So it's gotta be, you gotta start low and you gotta, you gotta progress slowly, right. You gotta resist the temptation to want to, um, you know, do the fad workout or whatever. Okay. How about um, mental side of the physical? We talked about 
how important physical activity is. Let's talk about mental focus or vice versa. Cause do they, have you found that they actually reinforce each other or how do they play? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's, um, I'm going a little bit outside my area of expertise, but this is what I will say. Having four kids in elementary school and, you know, uh, recess being cut way back because of COVID and gym, no gym teacher and all this stuff, you know, um, being an advocate for movement in kids because the research is very clear that kids who move more do better in school. You know, they perform better, they have higher grades and the same applies for adults. And if we go all the way to the other end of the spectrum, uh, one of my colleagues here, Lindsay Nagamatsu, so she does a lot of resistance training and, and cognitive gains um, in older adults. Um, and again, the relationship is very clear. Actually, she was just giving a presentation the other day. And after, I think it was a, a sixth or 12 month intervention, lifting weights twice a week, the hippocampus. So part of the brain responsible for executive function, um, usually as you age, it sort of, it decreases in size. Okay. And, uh, this exercise over the course of six or 12 months, not only did it like stabilize the size of the hippocampus, but it actually increase the size of the brain, the important part of the brain after just a year. You know, so imagine like engaging in regular exercise your entire life, how big that part of your brain will be compared to when it wasn't. So anyway, that's the sort of the cognitive bit. Um, the, the mood and anxiety piece is just like, you can't over, overstate how important that is, especially nowadays. In Ontario, where I live, we were allowed to do very few things during COVID. Um, you know, grocery store, exercise and that's pretty much it <laughs> wow right like you can go outside for a walk um you can go to the grocery store you can't do anything else you know so i think that just speaks to the importance of uh, of activity and maintaining people's mental well-being well and i'm glad that you know there's studies out there that i mean it makes just common sense but when you back it up with science now you you know for a lot of people that's that's what they need. Um, hey, let's talk about football real quick. I want to, thanks for all the, the, the uh, deeper stuff. Uh, but tell me about playing football and why did you get into kinesiology? What made you want to study that? Uh, you know, my mom did, uh, kinesiology is a fancy way of saying phys ed, right? Like I joke yep. around with my friends. I'm a really good phys ed teacher. <laughs> no offense to your phys ed teacher listeners. I've got I've got my, both my brother-in-laws are phys ed teachers, actually. Okay. Um, elementary school. Um, so it's phys ed, right? It's like, you know, uh, my little area is like exercise is medicine, but kinesiology is quite broad. I've got a colleague who's like a boxing historian. You know, I've got another colleague who studies mega sporting events, Olympics, Paralympics, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, another neuroscientist. So we all do like these very different narrow things. Okay. Um, but yeah, I guess it was like my mom, you know, she's a real inspiration for me and I was always a pretty good athlete growing up so it seemed like a natural fit yeah um and always wanted to play university sports um tried out for every high school team grade nine didn't make any teams um <laughs> you know that was <laughs> devastating tried out tried out for the football team in grade 10 made made it on a on a on a whim barely barely made it and just fell in love with football and the preparations and the playbook and the camaraderie and all that stuff and i just you know and then i ended up playing university ball which is my dream yeah had an amazing strength coach had an amazing coaches in general and then you know ended up being pretty fast you know yeah four four uh, at 220 is good man yeah so for i mean for no other reason i guess i was i was drafted uh, into the cfl the canadian football league and yeah it's a couple of the best years of my life. Why? Why were those a couple of best years of your life? Uh, you know, it's not the NFL, granted, but it's it felt like it was like the best of the best. We had like the best equipment manager. We had the best offensive coordinator. You know, like we had like we had the almost we had really good athletes. It's a it's a bit of a different game than the NFL. NFL smaller field, sort of bigger bodies. CFL's a bigger field, sort of more sort of moving around. Yeah. So it's a little bit of a different game. And it just so, so everybody knows. Tell me how big the uh, Canadian football field is. Your end zone is what, 25 yards or something? 20 yards, yeah. 20. Okay, go for it. What else is different? Is, is sidelines? Uh, yeah. How, how wide is the NFL field? Is ah, it like 40? I can't remember. 
Yeah, it's like 40. I think the Canadian is like 55 yards. Yeah, so it really opens up the game. Yeah, and then we're like 110 or 115 yards long, and then you guys are obviously 100. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, just – and three downs. So, so you're throwing the ball a ton. So, like, as a linebacker, you know, I'm actually in – like, in pass coverage a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's just – We used to call it the Apache back at Colorado. I played at CU for a year, and it's that – linebacker slash defensive back you know you're yeah. really you're both but go for it yeah 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 I was just gonna say and I just by fluke I ended up moving into this neighborhood in London Ontario right next to uh one of my old teammates you know from Calgary which is kind oh, of nice fun. yeah our kids our girl our girls play soccer together so you know that's probably what I miss most is just you know the the camaraderie and the friendships which is one yeah. of the reasons why football is so good because you've got like all of a sudden you've got a hundred people and you can you know choose your friends out of a big huge group of people you know yeah no i'm with you in fact camaraderie uh the little wolf was my uh rhodesian ridgeback i just we just uh rescued him 106 pounds um uh, he's amazing but uh it, tell me more about the camaraderie of how do you get it now in your life because you know those of us who were part of some really cool high performance teams whether it's you know in football whether it's in the military, Blue Angels, how do you how do you get that back into your own life now? Well, I'm starting to think now that I would like to ask, start asking you questions because I think your yeah. life background is way more way more interesting than mine. <laughs> but I'll, I'll answer the question and then I'll throw it back to you. Um, I I I am having a difficult time doing it actually. Mm -hmm. Four young kids, um, wife works shifts at the hospital. Yeah, she's an emergency room physician, right? Yeah, merge doc. Um, trying to establish myself in this like kind of competitive academic world. Yeah, it's, it's tough. So just you know, trying to make you know make time like two you know two like boys weekends a year if I'm lucky. You know, trying to use the phone. You know, calling guys up instead of text messaging. I just I find that doesn't necessarily get me the relationship I'm looking for. So yeah. you know, cold, cold calls with some of my old and best buddies. You know as often as possible how about you you know for me it i'm i'm action like you movement you know and uh so i'm fortunate in that now i get the privilege to speak all over the world so i'm actually in this constant state of movement i'll i'll be at 100 cities you know so far i think we've been in 68 this first half of the year right so for me i think part of that um, is the constant movement, you know, flying on airplanes, uh, preparing for a speech, talking to the, the, the CEO and the other people. Um, I think the other way for me is um, just communication with my team. You know, Sugar's on this call right now. We have really good team and communication. So we get a lot of reinforcement from the people around us. But what I'm working on in the third phase is because that can all be kind of under work, right, or professional. It's trying to get more of that personal, physical, and spiritual time in. And actually, what I find is I have to block it because uh, that, that I can only imagine with four kids, right, how your time can be just sucked up, right? So I've, I now block in physical activity. It's back to what your key is, you know, on um, every morning. Uh, mornings are key to me to get out and movement. Like I said, I just went to a Qigong class, which I really love because it's that energy, that movement. What is Qigong? What is Qigong? So Qigong is like Tai Chi. Um, it's a movement. It's a martial art, but it's much more fluid. And, and, it's, and you're concentrating mentally, not just physically, on raising your energy, you know, bringing energy in or calming it down. Um, you probably see them. I don't know if you see them much in Canada, but in the U.S., in San Francisco, I used to live there when I was a VC. And, and you just can see in the parks. It's usually, you know, Asian people because it happens to start there. Um, but they're all doing these kind of really fluid motion. And uh, if you've ever been to it, and anyone should try it. It's not hard. It's a movement, and uh, it just feels good. You yeah. know. Do you are you huffing and puffing when you do it? No, it's it's calm. It's um, it's so it's not aerobic, right? I, I, now, yeah. having said that, I'm sure there are ones that you can, but the yeah. the classes that I'm in are are fairly basic, and uh, it's it's uh, more about awareness of bringing energy up. And out the idea of the earth 
the idea of, you know, trees, all these kinds of things play into it. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, I do, I do a, a strength routine every morning. That's more of yoga and, uh, strength, you know, flexibility, right? So I'm bringing in the flexibility with some yoga and then I'll hit the weights, uh, usually three times a week. Uh, but that I do every day is a four to seven minute routine of stretching, but with movement that yeah. kind of what I was talking about. Yeah. How, how about you? What's your morning routine? Uh, well, I was just going to say more morning exercisers, I think are more likely to stick with it through, you know, the trials and tribulations of life than people who have okay. started at other times a day. Um, I, uh, I like like the midday movement. Okay. You know, so I try to like lunchtime, go for a walk. I've, I've staked out this new walk around our beautiful campus here at Western. Um, and then I'll lift some weights or, you know, actually with the pandemic, we bought this reluctantly bought this Peloton bike, which, <laughs> which makes me feel like an a-hole because it's so expensive. Right. But honestly, it's just been the music and the feedback you get with like the outputs and everything. I try to get home to do that at least a couple of weeks and then play hockey with some, some friends once a yeah. week, you know, but I, I'm trying to do something every day at the expense of my career, yeah. you know, like, like that's kind of like, that's the decision I feel like I have to make on a daily basis. Like, do I finish this task? You know, that's really important for my job or do I go for a walk? <laughs> Yeah. You know, and I'm, I mean, I'm in the business. So I'm like, I got, I'm, I got to do it. I got to go for this walk, you know, and I think I'm actually doing better in my job as a result. Yeah. You know, you know and I, yeah, that's it. No, no, keep going. That's it. That's it. I'm talking. Well, I like how vulnerable you are and open you are about it. You know, you're right. You're, you're, you know, you're one of the experts on movement, right. And, uh, and you're, you're still being honest about, you know, it's hard. I mean, we get, you know, we get just caught up like, for me today is a ball buster. I'm going from meeting to meeting to meeting. All right. So I actually had to, I mean, we're doing podcasts. I'm going to be on somebody else's podcast. We have two briefing calls with clients. We're doing an event. There's going to be 6,500 people there tonight. I'm actually emceeing uh, an event for a buddy of mine who uh, NFL pro football player climbed Everest and they just did the NFL today did a movie on it. Uh, called chasing your summit i think is what it is it won the emmy for best picture and so he needs an mc so i'm i'm you know preparing that right and uh and i'm just going from event to event event and i really my wife's so good about you need to schedule a break you know during lunch otherwise you know not only will, will my team schedule something but i will i will fit in something there right so i just thanks for being honest because i think everyone who's listening to this you know, realizes that we all have challenges, you know, if you're busy working and, uh, and then the kids and, and taking care of yourself, your own personal health, if you don't take care of yourself, you're not gonna be able to take care of others very well. So um, I, I, I commend you for that. Um, and uh, what's the tips we can give somebody or just, just respond to that. And then as we start to wrap up, what can we do to help people? Um, you know, perform better. Or, or be, what do you mean? Just to be a better father, to enjoy life better, to be a better, um, you know, to, to be healthy in order to uh, have a longer life. You know, the, the things that you started this whole podcast with, you know, just walking, right? Yeah, honestly, that's probably what I would say. Yeah, I mean, that's just me, you know, and, and my, my worldview. Um, you know, obviously, there's the spiritual bit that, that is, is important and, and, and relationships you know it's funny our newfoundland is our your oh. easternmost province um it's also the province with the highest rate of like obesity and all these diseases but they also have more hundred year olds than any other province in canada which makes no sense right? well, what's the what's the the i was just up in um quebec right quebec city and what do you eat there? That's it, it's not healthy, but it's it's a poo, something with a P, right? It's poutine. Poutine. I'm a I'm a poutine connoisseur. We should schedule another podcast to talk about poutines. Oh, we should. <laughs> so that is poutine healthy or not? Oh it's good for the it's good for the soul. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah, it is, and it's good when you live in cold climates because it it gives you a lot of calories to burn, right? Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. For the, so for the listeners, it's French fries. 
uh, cheese curds and gravy. <laughs> you, gotta, you know, I mean, I, I like to eat well. I try to, I don't necessarily like, but I do. Um, my wife says one of my favorite food groups is fried. You know, and um, that's not healthy, right? But uh, the idea of, of, of French fries and you add cheese and then you add gravy. That's why, you know, be careful, everybody. That's a treat. Poutine's a treat. It's a sometimes food. <laughs> yeah. Hey, let's, uh, let's, let's start to wrap up with number one. I, I really enjoyed this. Um, you know, for me, the biggest takeaway, it started quite simply. Uh, just walk. Just get outside, you know, and 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 walk. Uh, so important for all of us. Um, how does gratitude play into this? Um, and it's big for me. Glad to be here. Um, have you? What does gratitude mean to you? And how does it play into uh, having a healthier, uh, better life? Man. I don't know. I, I don't want to be too single minded, but I'm definitely more thankful after I've gone for a walk, mm -hmm. um, after I've been to church. Um, you know, and it's it's everything like when I when I think of it, when I watch the news, you know, and I see, you know, these destroyed cities in Ukraine or, you know, some of the atrocities going on in Canada, even, you know, and and then I, and then I think back to myself, I'm like, oh, I'm having a bad day. I'm like, you know, my wife rubbed me the wrong way or my kids aren't behaved. You know, it just, it puts everything in, in it helps those kinds of things help to put things in perspective. Yeah. yeah. So. No, I'm with you. You know, it's, it, it, I'm glad you mentioned that the outside world can put a lot of negativity on us. Right. And yeah. getting outside and, and, and back to the importance of why I wanted you on our podcast, physical activity changes my brain. And with that, um, it does help me to be more present. What am I grateful for as I take a walk? I think maybe that's a good takeaway for people. You know, when you're walking, uh, it's one thing to be walking and then be thinking of all the problems, like what you're missing, you know, and I, and I actually do that. My wife calls me on it all the time. We'll take uh, the two Ridgebacks and we'll go for a walk. And about halfway through the walk, she goes, what are you thinking about? You're not here. You're not present. And she knows it every single time. She's absolutely right that I'm thinking about some challenge and work. Right. And, yeah. and, and it's like, no, get back into the present. There's beauty all around you. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like a rid I, I think uh, Dr. Greg Wells, who, who, you know, I think he did, uh, he might've done a podcast or, or a post on that, like the rhythmic sort of movement, you know, and, and then being alone, maybe even, you know, that combination just gets the creative juices flowing. Gets the wait, wait a minute. What's the combination again? Um, sort of that, that rhythmic outdoor movement, you know, rhythmic bike. outdoor movement. Yeah. Biking, um, you know, walking. Oh, that's when the creativity water. sparks. Yeah. And, and, and everything else, right? The gratitude juices, the creativity juices. You know, I often think of my best ideas when I'm walking somewhere. Yeah. But I don't know about you. It's definitely not when I'm staring at my computer. Yeah. So that's huge. Well, there's a big takeaway for everybody. Okay. I want to, uh, I'm going to end on what I call a, a glad to be here, share out moment. Uh, I'll start and then you get to wrap up the podcast. Um, Thanks so much, Mark, for being here, man. Uh, I'm so grateful to have this moment with you. I know you got a lot going on in your world um, as a professor and as uh, with four kids. I didn't know you had four kids, by the way. That's kind of cool. Um, and, uh, and thanks for sharing your wisdom with, with everyone who's listening. And what I really am grateful about is how um, simplistic in a good way uh, it is. And that is, let's get movement out there. Let's get walking so we can, so everybody can benefit from this, not just a world-class athlete. So uh, you got, you got my attention. I'm going to make sure I go for a walk today. And, uh, and I know most people don't know this, but you said before we started that you had just got back from well, walking or lifting some weights. So uh, you're living your model and I'm grateful you're here. Glad to be here. Over to you. Thanks. Um, final word, you mean? Yeah, like what do you, uh, uh, the final word, actually, here we go. I'm sorry. I, I like to do two final words. One is, is there a certain saying, a certain quote, something that you live your life by that you would want to leave with our audience? Uh, that's number one. And then just end with a glad to be here statement. So you get the wrap, go for it. Okay. 
Okay, this is uh, this is actually a sentence I just read like yesterday. Nice. I think. But I think it's fitting um, if I'm trying to come up with a tagline off, like on the spot. And this is what I'm going to say. Now is not the time to be still. Nice. That's it. Um, and then I'm I'm grateful to be here because I just I like I don't even know enough about you and you just seem like an amazing man and I'm I'm, I'm grateful that you uh, invited me to to chat. So thanks, Mark. We always end with glad to be here and uh, we'll make sure everyone go to Caterpillar. That sounds well when you can after you guys yeah. approve the model in England. Um, it sounds like you're going to change a lot of lives. So I appreciate that. Glad to be here, buddy. Gucci. All right. See you. Bye.